It is a pleasure to welcome you to the third edition of the lecture series on advancements in geotechnical engineering, from research to practice. The AGERP lecture series is a pro bono initiative led by Dr. Partha Mishra and Professor Sarat Das. Initiated in 2020, it is aimed at disseminating the coupled learnings from academia and industry on some of the key topics in geotechnical engineering. The International Workshop on Unsaturated Soils was hosted in 2022 during the third edition of the AGERP lecture series. The following lecture on unsaturated soil parameters was delivered by Professor David Toll at this workshop. David Toll is Professor of Engineering and Co-Director of the Institute of Hazard, Risk and Resilience at Durham University. He is Chair of the British Geotechnical Association and has just completed an eight-year term as Chair of the Technical Committee on Unsaturated Soils of the International Society for Soil Mechanics and Geotechnical Engineering. He is a Fellow of the Learned Society of Wales and a Fellow of the Institution of Civil Engineers. He has been carrying out research into unsaturated and tropical soils for over 35 years. The main applications of his research are in the impacts of climate change on infrastructure slopes rainfall-induced landslides and use of naturally occurring materials in road construction. He is currently editor-in-chief of the Springer Nature Journal, Geotechnical and Geological Engineering and has served as a member of the editorial boards for Geotechnique and Quarterly Journal of Engineering Geology and Hydrogeology. Well, good day, everybody, and uh, it's a great pleasure to be part of this uh, uh, international workshop on unsaturated soils. As Professor Das has said, I'll talk about unsaturated soil uh, parameters. And I'll focus on three uh, areas that are key uh, to be able to model unsaturated soil behavior. So I'll talk about soil water retention curves, uh, hydraulic uh, conductivity or permeability to water, and then uh, something about unsaturated shear strength. So let's start with the soil water retention curve, uh, uh, often called the, the soil water characteristic curve. Uh, and uh, we're familiar with the, this in terms of it providing us with the relationship between the volumetric uh, water content or some other measure of water content, as we'll see in, in a moment, uh, and uh, suction. Uh, and uh, we know this relationship is highly hysteretic. Uh, so if we start from a saturated state and dry out our soil, we'll follow a, a primary drying curve uh, until we get up into the residual uh, suction. So we have the steep desaturation curve. And then once we go beyond the residual suction, it becomes harder to remove the water and, uh, uh, and, and we're dealing with water that's much more closely adsorbed onto the soil particles. Uh, and if we wet the soil from a very dry state, uh, we follow a, a primary wetting uh, curve. And we may not uh, come back to the original state in terms of the water content. And then, of course, within those uh, boundaries of the primary drying and the primary wetting curve, uh, we have what we call scanning curves. So if we've been drying the soil and we stop at some point and start to wet, we follow a flatter scan curve uh, until we uh, come across and reach the primary wetting curve and rejoin it there. Or if we've been following a, uh, the primary wetting curve and we stop and uh, change to drying, we would follow uh, a, a drying curve, something like that, uh, and scan across until we reach the primary drying curve. So in terms of being able to monitor uh, the water retention curve, uh, the techniques we're now uh, using uh, in Durham uh, make use of high capacity tensiometers, uh, which allow us to give direct measurements of suction up to about uh, two MPA uh, of, of negative pressure. Uh, the device uh, we use, uh, you can see a frame here sitting on an electronic balance. So we have continuous monitoring of mass. So we know the changes in water content. Uh, you can see in the bottom of the frame a little white spot. That's the top of a tensiometer. And you can see the high capacity tensiometer that we've developed at Durham here. 
which allows us to measure to two uh, uh, megapascals. And you can see that this is where the, uh, the sample uh, would fit here. And we're using LBDTs to measure the change in diameter and the change in height of the specimen. So we have continuous measurements of water, uh, of volume change as well as suction and water content. And you can see in this top right uh, slide, this is a, a sample uh, typically 20 millimeters high uh, by either 75 millimeters or 100 millimeters. Uh, and uh, we've got some cowls there that we can actually control the rate of drying so we can uh, allow it to dry out at the rate we want to. And we also have uh, wetting systems to allow us to do continuous drying and wetting. So it allows us, uh, as I say, continuous measurements of water content and suction. And most importantly, it also allows us continuous measurement of volume change. Uh, and uh, I'll sort of emphasize at this point that we must get into routinely measuring volume change as part of our water retention measurements. And I'll talk about why in, in, in a moment. Uh, the tensiometers have a limit of about 2 MPa. So if we go beyond that, uh, we now uh, almost entirely use the chilled mirror hydrometer, hydrometer the, uh, the WP4C. Uh, and that can take us up to the high suction range. Uh, and so we can extend our curves beyond the two MPA. And of course, that's a, a total suction measurement rather than a matrix suction measurement. So what form of soil water retention curves uh, should we be using? Let's have a look at uh, a curve uh, for a clay soil uh, and uh, we're plotting here the gravimetric water content against uh, uh, suction. And gravimetric water content is what we traditionally use in uh, geotechnical engineering. Um, and uh, we can see that uh, as the soil actually dries, suction's increasing and we're getting that reduction in water content uh, until we get to that uh, residual zone. Now, I know a lot of people looking at this curve uh, would actually say that this is all part of the desaturation process. And I've, I've seen people interpreting curves like this and saying, okay, the air entry value must be somewhere around here, somewhere around 10 kPa, if we were to extrapolate back to a, a saturated water content, maybe as they, as they would see it. Well, as we'll see in a moment, that's completely wrong, uh, because in fact, the soil here is remaining completely saturated uh, up to this point. We haven't reached the air entry value uh, even by uh, this point here. And we can see that if we go on to plot the shrinkage curve for the same test. Uh, so again, if we're measuring volume change, we're able to calculate uh, measurements of void ratio uh, as the soil is actually drying out. Uh, and I'm plotting this as a conventional shrinkage curve. Uh, so we can see uh, uh, this dotted line here actually represents full saturation, uh, degree of saturation of 100%. So we can see that the initially this sample is shrinking entirely in a saturated state. It's actually just reducing in volume and not desaturating at all. And it's only when we get down to a water content of about 45% that we start departing from a saturated uh, condition. And we can see that we get down to the shrinkage limit at about 32% uh, here, uh, and it levels off. And eventually we get to that uh, point where we have no further volume change uh, even though the soil continues to dry. So if we just remember those two points, so something around 45% when it actually departs from saturation in, in the sense of a desaturation point, and then the shrinkage limit of about 32. So if we just go back to the plot, we can see that the soil remains completely saturated here. And it's only when we get to 32% uh, here 
that we reach the shrinkage limit. And in fact, we can actually see a break in the uh, water retention uh, curve at that point. So that's, uh, in fact, represents our air entry value. Uh, and so we have to be very careful in interpreting curves if we're looking at them in gravimetric uh, terms. So let's have a look at uh, if we plot the same data in terms of uh, volumetric water content. So of course that's defined as volume of water divided by total volume. Uh, it's the measure that soil scientists have uh, used for many years and we've uh, uh, sort of adopted it a little bit. Uh, if we take this particular clay soil and look at it, what we can see is again, that the soil when it's in a saturated state uh, still shows a sloping line in volumetric uh, suction uh, terms. Uh, and again, uh, you have to be a little bit careful in terms of how you interpret that. Uh, again, I've seen people assuming that because this is still sloping, that there must, must be a flat plateau up here somewhere and that the air entry is up, still up here. Uh, but as you can see, if we extend, uh, put a, a linear line through the initial portion and then a linear portion uh, through the desaturation part of the curve, we end up with an air entry value that's uh, around 2000 kPa for this particular soil. And then a residual water content uh, down at about 5% in terms of volumetric water content. And of course, an alternative is to plot this in terms of degree of saturation. So volume of water divided by volume of voids. And now we can see very clearly that the soil is remaining fully saturated for that first part of the shrinkage uh, curve and the uh, drying process. Uh, and again, if we do our bilinear extrapolation, we would end up as a, an air entry value uh, at around 2000 kPa. But again, you know, as uh, just, just to make the point again, we talk about this thing called the air entry value, which we represent as the change from a transition state from one, uh, the saturated state to the desaturation. Uh, the reality is this soil is actually starting to desaturate at around 200 kPa, and we've got that uh, curved uh, part of it. Uh, but the main transition point, we would say, is somewhere around 2000. That's our air entry value. And again, residual uh, degree of saturation is about 10% degree of saturation. Now, I find this a very useful way of keeping in mind uh, our water retention behavior and volumetric change in one curve. And that's to use the water ratio, uh, which we can define as the volume of water to the volume of solids. Uh, it's also equal to the void ratio times the degree of saturation. So when degree of saturation is one, uh, EW equals E. And it's also equal to the water content uh, times the degree of uh, the specific gravity. Uh, so in other words, it's just a scaled version of gravimetric water content. But the nice thing is that we can plot uh, void ratio and water ratio on the same graph. And when the soil is saturated, they plot together. Uh, so we can immediately see the saturated zone. And then we can see that uh, around 200 kPa, they start to deviate. Uh, the void ratio starts to flatten a little bit. We have, uh, and the water content starts departing from the linear trend. Uh, and we end up with uh, our, if you like, our shrinkage curve now plotted in terms of suction rather than water content. And we would say that probably the shrinkage limit uh, is uh, uh, actually coincident with the, with the air entry value uh, of, of, of the soil. And we can see all that very nicely on one plot uh, if we use this idea of using water ratio to plot things. And we can see where the air entry value is and where the residual value is. So it's a very convenient way of interpreting the data.
But we have to recognize when we talk about uh, water retention curves, that in fact, we should be thinking about water retention surfaces uh, and that uh, the void ratio of the, uh, of the soil uh, creates different water retention behaviors. And we can see this uh, uh, plot from uh, Gallipoli et al. in, in 2003, uh, where they suggested uh, plotting uh, degree of saturation against suction against specific volume. Uh, and we can see the shape of the surface that's actually involved there, uh, recognizing the void ratio changes the water retention behavior. And again, a set of data by Alessandro Tarantino uh, in 2009, uh, where the testing was done and maintaining constant water content, but the constant void ratio lines, and we can see the different uh, curves uh, here. Uh, now, interestingly, in this particular plot, we can see uh, the data goes up to 1000 uh, kPa of matrix suction, and the curves seem to be parallel at that stage. Uh, my, uh, uh, what we've seen in our data sets is that these curves tend to come together uh, at higher suction, uh, and so they won't remain parallel uh, at, at higher suction levels. And we can see this here in a set of uh, uh, plots. Uh, this is all for a, a sandy clay, a glacial till from, uh, from Durham in the, in the northeast of England. Uh, and we've got a set of uh, data plotted in terms of gravimetric water contents against matrix suction. Uh, for samples that are compacted very wet, uh, up around uh, above 25%, uh, we end up with defining the primary drying line for this material. And again, we can see the constant lines here are uh, generated using the tensiometer uh, and then uh, additional data from the WP4C, or in fact, also some filter paper measurements uh, going up above, uh, uh, above two, kPa, uh, two megapascals, uh, where the tensiometer is no longer able to measure. But what we can see here is uh, data uh, of specimens uh, com compacted slightly drier, 20% uh, uh, water content rather than 26%. And we see that the water retention curves are certainly a bit flatter than the primary drying curve. But as we go up to higher suction, they're tending to merge into the primary drying line. And uh, what we would expect is uh, that uh, uh, they, they all come together uh, at, the, at the higher end. But certainly we have to recognize that our water retention behavior is very dependent on that in initial uh, water con uh, void ratio uh, or water content. Uh, nice data sets uh, that's available uh, is, is data by Agus et al. Uh, and, uh, uh, you listened to Harry Antarajo talking uh, yesterday and, uh, of course, one of the uh, great uh, uh, centers for unsaturated soil uh, in Singapore. Uh, they've collected together very large data sets of, uh, uh, of water retention curves for their Singapore residual soils. And they've been able to define uh, from, from their database average lines with upper and lower bones uh, by defining the starting uh, water content in terms of volumetric uh, water content. And so we can see for a, a specimen that starts at a volumetric water content of 0.55 here, uh, we, we can draw in the envelope based on their expectations. And the red points are a, a test that was actually carried out and is in good agreement with their, their average line uh, for, for these materials. But we can also see that samples that are uh, taken from uh, different depths uh, actually have different starting volumetric water contents based on different void ratios. Uh, and we can see we end up with very different uh, water retention behaviors. So we have to take account of that starting condition when we're deciding what water retention curve to use in our analyses. We also have to recognize uh, that the water retention curve is not static. Uh, 
that if we go through cycles of drying and wetting, uh, the water retention curve will, will change and shift. Uh, and again, this is data uh, from, uh, from our Durham till, uh, the glacial till that you saw some data for previously. And what we can see here is uh, this is the primary drying line uh, for this material. Uh, if we start from a sample that's compacted at around 23% uh, water content with initial suction of 10 kPa and let, uh, let it dry, uh, we see it uh, drying nicely and coming on to uh, fit with the primary drying curve. If we then wet that, uh, it wets up to a point over here. And so we're wetting it actually slightly wetter than it started. Uh, but then when we dry it, we've come down this uh, uh, second drying curve, uh, which is much flatter than the first one. And so essentially we're seeing that with each cycle of drying and wetting, we get this shift in the water retention curve. And that usually continues for four or five cycles before it tends to settle down uh, and, and we get uh, more reproducible uh, behavior. So when we're planning uh, what water retention curve to, to use. We should also be thinking of whether the water retention curve is actually going to shift with time uh, in, in our field's uh, uh, conditions. So we get a progressive shift uh, with each cycle of drying and wetting until it stabilizes. Now let's think about hydraulic conductivity, another vital parameter when we're trying to model unsaturated soil behavior. Uh, and this is uh, a plot of relative conductivity uh, against degree of saturation. And we've got the plot here for the air, permeab air permeability, the red line, uh, and that's expressed as the relative permeability KRA, uh, which is the air permeability uh, relative to the dry uh, air permeability when the soil is completely dry. And so we start off with a value of one once uh, we're below a degree of saturation of about 20%. Uh, and as the soil actually dries out, uh, the air permeability, sorry, as the soil wets up and the degree of saturation increases, the air permeability reduces because there are fewer air voids for air to flow through. And once we get to about 0.8, uh, we're starting to reach the point of occlusion and uh, the, the, uh, we almost reach zero air permeability once the soil reaches saturation. But if we look at the water saturation, uh, we start off at, uh, again, relating that to the saturated conductivity of water. Uh, we, we see that when the soil is saturated, we start off with a relative value of one. And again, that reduces very rapidly uh, and uh, as the amount of water reduces, uh, the water will tend to flow through the water fill voids. And so we have quite significant loss in permeability. And again, may actually get down to uh, zero uh, water permeability once the degree of saturation is such that we don't have continuity of water, pour, water fill pores. Uh, so we still have some water, but it's no longer connected so that water can flow through. Now, uh, just to get a sense of how much permeability changes, uh, this is a, a nice plot that uh, Fredlin, uh, Jing and Huang uh, presented based on data from Brooks and Corey. Uh, and we can see here the, uh, a plot of normalized water content against soil suction. So this is the water retention curve. Uh, and we can see that it's desaturating uh, over this sort of range from uh, about 6 kPa up to uh, something like 18 kPa, a big change uh, in the degree of saturation. And we can see that the relative coefficient of permeability changes from just under one uh, near saturated uh, 2.01. Uh, so we're changing by a couple of orders of magnitude as the soil actually goes through this desaturation process. And so these are very significant changes that we have to take account of in our, our, our modeling. 
Now, again, I'm going to draw on an example from uh, Singapore because uh, it's one of the few uh, sets of data where we actually have experimental measurements uh, from uh, Agus, uh, from his PhD, uh, where he actually measured unsaturated permeability uh, as a function of suction. And uh, we can see that he measured the permeability on two specimens uh, uh, at different, uh, taken from different depths with different initial void ratios and uh, measured the initial saturated permeability, in this case at about 10 to the minus eight. Uh, and then by the time we got to sort of uh, uh, 30, uh, 50 kPa of suction, uh, we can see that the permeability is actually reduced. Uh, and interestingly, what we can see is that we've got two samples that start with uh, permeabilities that are an order of magnitude different. But by the time we've got to 100 kPa, uh, they're both showing the same sort of value of, uh, of unsaturated permeability. Now, interestingly, uh, because we have very few experimental measurements of unsaturated permeability, uh, we often uh, use uh, predictive methods like the Green and Corey method uh, based on saturated permeability uh, to uh, calculate what the uh, unsaturated permeability function uh, should be. And for a, a specimen here, uh, 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 we were, were actually looking at uh, uh, a, a specimen from 0.4 meters deep where we measured the field permeability as uh, just below 10 to the minus six uh, here. If we did a Green and Corey uh, calculation uh, based on that saturated permeability, we would end up with a uh, that black line. Now, similarly, if we did a Green and Corey based on this particular sample, we would have predicted the permeability function to look something like that based on the water retention curve. Whereas in fact, the experimental measurements show something very different indeed. So in this sort of range here, around 100 kPa of suction, we would, uh, Green and Corey would be predicting a permeability of 10 to the minus 13 or even below, whereas the experimental measurements are actually more like 10 to the minus nine. So that's four orders of magnitude uh, discrepancy there between uh, the uh, expected from uh, these uh, uh, predictive methods and experimental measurements. Uh, so what we uh, did in this particular case was since we only had a saturated measurement there, we used Green and Corey to predict what was happening over this range where we didn't have any measurements, but we assumed that, uh, that our sample uh, would have joined uh, this experimental data set. And so the red line, uh, red dotted line there is what we used as a permeability function uh, to model this particular uh, this was a slope stability application we were looking at. So just a, a note to beware uh, that these predictive methods like Green and Corey may not give us uh, the, the, the answer that is based in reality. Let's also look at uh, shear strength of unsaturated soils. Uh, we can go back to the beginnings of unsaturated soil mechanics uh, with Bishop back in 1959, uh, where he pr pr produced this effective stress approach. And I put effective stress in quotation marks there uh, because I, we, we shouldn't be talking about effective stresses in unsaturated soils. Uh, but he came up with the idea of combining net stress and suction together using this experimental uh, parameter chi uh, and came up with some values of this parameter chi based on degree of saturation uh, for some uh, different uh, materials. Uh, and so chi was seen to be a function of degree of saturation. Now we've tended to move towards using a, a simple assumption that chi 
can be related, can be taken as equal to the degree of saturation, which certainly we can see is uh, uh, close to the case for high degrees of saturation uh, up here. Uh, and so uh, we often now use this thing called the Bishop stress, uh, where we replace the chi value with degree of saturation and end up with partitioning the water phase by the degree of saturation and the air phase by one minus the degree of saturation uh, to take account of the two fluid pressions. Now, uh, an alternative to that was proposed by uh, Fredland et al. In, in, the, in the 1970s, where rather than trying to combine things into uh, one uh, stress parameter, uh, Fredland and his co-workers identified that we, could, we should treat uh, the net stress and the suction differently and use different angles of friction, phi A and phi B. And they went on to assume that phi A was equal to phi dashed, uh, the saturated uh, value, and the same for the cohesion, uh, this uh, double dashed term here, they assume was equal to the effective cohesion of the soil. And so this is this equation at the bottom is what we generally see used uh, in, uh, currently. Uh, so we have a shear strength equation that relates uh, a, a true uh, effective cohesion. Uh, and we assume that the net stress uh, operates through a phi dash term and the suction contributes through a phi B term. So that's what it uh, looks like if we try and plot it in three dimensions. So uh, shear stress against net stress with a suction axis going into the, uh, the paper here. Uh, and we see that in the front plane, where the suction is zero, we assume we're in the saturated plane and we've got C dashed and phi dashed. And we're assuming that uh, uh, the shear strength increases by phi B as we go out on the suction axis. So if we just look at that by taking three slices across that uh, plane, uh, so we've got the frontal plane here, the saturated state where we've got uh, zero suction. And then let's look at three different values of increasing suction, uh, suction one, suction two, suction three, going backwards uh, in, on the suction uh, axis. Uh, and what we'll do is plot those uh, just in the uh, sigma minus ua, the net stress uh, uh, plane. And what we would typically see would be that they would plot uh, like that. So this is just now shear strength against net stress. And we could see that when the suction is zero, uh, we're close to saturated, and we would actually have the saturated parameters uh, if there is a true cohesion, C dashed, and uh, phi dash would be the, uh, the angle of friction. But then as we, uh, as suction is increasing, what we can see is that we have a, an increase in strength uh, as a result of that suction component, uh, which in this particular plot, we're representing by different values of apparent cohesion, C1, C2, and C3, representing these three different values uh, of uh, suction, increasing values of suction. And uh, we're identifying that as phi A, the angle. Uh, and we can see that generally it's true that phi A is not always hugely different to phi dashed. The major component of strength that we gain from suction is these in, uh, uh, the apparent cohesion uh, as a result of the suction holding the soil together uh, and, and giving it strength. So what we can now do is look at these values of apparent cohesion and see how they relate to these suction values. And typically we'd see uh, this if we plotted in a matrix suction uh, plane, uh, that when the suction is zero uh, in, in a saturated state uh, or what we can assume to be a saturated state, we've got our true cohesion there. And then we have these uh, apparent cohesions, which now we can plot against the actual values of suction uh, in this uh, suction plane. And we can see that uh, the, the shear strength increases with suction, uh, 
Uh, initially, the slope of this line, which is defined as our phi B parameter, uh, if we're below the air entry value, then phi B is going to be equal to phi dash. But we can see that once we go beyond the air entry value, the soil uh, starts to desaturate, uh, and we no longer have a linear relationship uh, between uh, the shear strength and uh, the, the suction increase. And so phi B is continuously changing, and we may well even get to a case where we, we end up with a, a tangent value of phi B uh, that becomes uh, zero. So uh, this is a set of data for a, uh, a lateritic gravel from, from Kenya uh, that I published some time ago uh, now, where uh, looking at the data, we separated out the effects of suction and net stress uh, and plotted uh, the angles of friction uh, phi A and phi B against degree of saturation. And you can see that at, uh, when the soil is saturated, uh, both phi A and phi B are equal to phi dash, the saturated angle of friction uh, for, for this material. Uh, as you would expect, uh, as the degree of saturation reduces, we see that phi B is reducing away. Uh, and in fact, in this particular material, which was a compacted soil, we found that once we got down to a degree of saturation of about 50%, uh, that uh, phi B actually became zero. And that's because in a, a compacted soil, you have aggregations uh, of uh, material held together by the clay matrix, uh, and the water reduces inside the, uh, the micropores uh, and no longer has any influence on the macro behavior of the uh, soil. It still controls the strength within the aggregations itself, uh, but not of the inter-aggregation uh, behavior. And interestingly, we found that uh, our interpretation of the values of phi A actually started to increase uh, above uh, the value of phi dash. And so, although by this point, suction was no longer uh, influencing the phi B value, uh, we hadn't, didn't have any strength due to suction contributing to strength, that the soil was actually stronger than a saturated state uh, because we had these aggregates very strongly held together by uh, suction and they were behaving much more like uh, a, a more granular material uh, because we had these aggregations of particles held together by suction. So let's have a, a think about uh, this assumption of the, the phi B, uh, sorry, the, uh, uh, the Bishop uh, approach. Uh, and I'll plot some data here. Uh, this is uh, actually the, the glacial till that I talked about uh, before. It's called the bionic soil here. Uh, it's actually uh, a sandy clay material. And what I'm plotting here is critical state uh, points from a set of saturated uh, triaxial tests. And we're plotting that in terms of deviator stress Q against the mean effective stress P dashed. And you can see the blue points here are the saturated uh, tests. And we can draw in a critical state line, which is the full line and the black line here. And we can show the uncertainty uh, the, the range of values with these dotted lines uh, based on the, the Wilson scatter and the, uh, the saturated data here. Now, if we actually use the Bishop uh, stress uh, idea uh, using chi equal to the degree of saturation, so we're just measuring, um, multiplying the suction by the degree of saturation, we can see that the data points for the uh, constant water content tests, uh, unsaturated tests, uh, where we were carrying out constant water content tests and measuring the suctions. And we're plotting those in terms of Bishop stress using the degree of saturation. We can see that the red points uh, actually scatter within the same range as the saturated uh, uh, test results. 
So that would suggest that for this material, uh, the assumption that uh, uh, we can come up with a bishop stress uh, based on just degree of saturation works pretty well. Now the caveat here is that you might not uh, appreciate is that all these data points represent degrees of saturation greater than 75%. So they're at the higher end of the degree of saturation uh, range. And so certainly in this particular material, the sandy clay, we can say that for degrees of saturation greater than 75%, uh, that uh, the Bishop stress approach gives us a good prediction of shear strength uh, for this uh, unsaturated state. We can also look at the uh, Kiyunyu sol, the lateritic gravel from Kenya, that again, I've showed you some data for previously, uh, and do the same sort of exercise. Uh, you can see the saturated data points here define a critical state line very clearly uh, here. And that if we plot the unsaturated uh, tests, uh, we can see that some of them cluster around that uh, the saturated line. But certainly we can see that when we've got uh, values of degrees of saturation of 40 or 50 percent, that they're falling some way away from that, uh, uh, that prediction line from the saturated tests. And so clearly this assumption that uh, Chi's the degree of saturation uh, doesn't work well for the low degrees of saturation uh, in this uh, particular material. But if we look at the, uh, the, the tests where the degree of saturation again is greater than 75%, uh, we can see some of these test results uh, here. We can see that that sort of blue zone there, we still get pretty good agreement between uh, the unsaturated tests and the saturated tests. So that simple uh, approach uh, seems to work reasonably well for high degrees of saturation again. And again, this is some uh, data from uh, Jurong soil in uh, Singapore. Uh, uh, and again, you can see the blue line uh, points defining the, the saturated critical state line. And uh, again, we can see that for the high degrees of saturation, generally they're clustering around uh, the, the, the same sort of region. Um, and uh, uh, maybe not as clear uh, as, as we've seen in the previous plots, uh, but they're uh, still quite realistic uh, in, in terms of the prediction of, of strength. So uh, just to uh, draw some conclusions uh, based on, on that, and uh, hopefully have some time for questions. Uh, so the uh, soil water retention curves and hydraulic conductivity or the permeability functions are essential for us to understand and certainly to be able to model unsaturated soil behavior. Uh, and uh, the, these are the sorts of parameters that we have to put into numerical models, whether you, we're using CW or Plexus or Code Brights or uh, any number of numerical models that can handle unsaturated soil behavior. Uh, what uh, I would say is that our measurements of soil suction have greatly improved. Uh, uh, we have these high capacity tensiometers available to us now that allow us to measure suctions up to a, a couple of megapascals. And we can go beyond that with the chilled vera hygrometers uh, to measure suctions up to very high suctions uh, uh, relatively simply now. And that's been a big change in the, uh, the, the last decade. What I always want to emphasize is that we should always measure volume change as part of our uh, determination of our water retention behavior. Uh, assuming a rigid porous media is just not enough. It may be true for some soils, but for once we have uh, soils that have any sort of clay fraction, uh, they are gonna change in volume. Uh, and we really have to recognize that in terms of interpreting our water retention behavior. Hydraulic conductivity or permeability to water changes by several orders of magnitude, sometimes with quite small changes in suction. So we saw that uh, a suction going from uh, maybe four or five kPa to 15 kPa produced two orders of magnitude of suction change. 
So it's really critical that we build that into our unsaturated soil models. And unfortunately, our conventional interpretation of that hydraulic conductivity function using uh, prediction methods like the Green and Corey method may not necessarily agree with experimental data. And we desperately need more experimental data on unsaturated permeability uh, and uh, to, to get better prediction methods uh, for this. Uh, but always be aware that that might not be what you're expecting. And then finally, in terms of shear strength, uh, we can see the shear strength of unsaturated soils uh, can be explained by separate stress state variables and net stress and matrix suction. Uh, Fredland's 5B approach works very well uh, and is uh, the basis of uh, many of the uh, calculation methods that we're using, uh, particularly in terms of uh, limit equilibrium approaches. Uh, but certainly 5B is not a constant value, uh, but as we've seen, it varies with suction or degree of saturation. Uh, and so we need to build that uh, approach in. Uh, Bishop stress, uh, which incorporates degree of saturation, can be useful, uh, provided it's used with suction as a further stress uh, uh, variable. Uh, we should certainly shouldn't see it as an effective stress. Uh, we still need suction as an additional variable to understand how soils actually behave. But for the simple case of shear strength, uh, certainly not the case for volume change, Bishop stress works reasonably well for high degrees of saturation. And for those of us working on things like uh, rainfall induced landslides, uh, then of course, it's the high degrees of saturation when we have rainfall infiltration that we're often trying to model. And so Bishop stress, uh, which, uh, for instance, is available as part of the Flaxis uh, software platform, uh, can often give us realistic predictions of uh, behavior. But we have to recognize that it's limited to those high degrees of saturation. References to this are actually in the soil science literature rather than the technical I mean, we, we can often go back to classic texts like uh, Barber uh, and the uh, text in soil physics to understand some of these uh, particular things. So uh, I think we haven't uh, made enough in the geotechnical uh, community uh, about. Uh, uh, and so there are papers uh, around. Uh, but often our textbooks tend to uh, not to deal with this in a lot of detail. So I think it's something that you still have to look for the, uh, the, the, the good publications uh, in, the, uh, in, in the journal articles rather than, uh, than, than the textbooks. But I'm, I'm happy for, for people to correct me if they, they know of a good textbook that deals with this. So hydraulic permeability, uh, we, we uh, used to describe the flow of water uh, through soil. And so, you know, sometimes we talk about permeability uh, of water, uh, of the soil to water. Uh, but in an unsaturated soil, of course, we might be talking about permeability of airflow or gas flow or something else. So we either have to say permeability to water uh, if, if we're dealing only with uh, water flow. Uh, but if we're talking about hydraulic conductivity, that's what we mean. And so, again, it's uh, a, a, just a, a terminology uh, use. Uh, the, uh, again, the soil scientists tend to refer to the hydraulic conductivity. Uh, in geotechnical literature, we, we've generally called it the, the coefficient of permeability. And we just have to recognize now that we have different values depending on whether we're looking at water flow or air or gas or oil or whatever other fluid. Uh, so we, if we talk about permeability in unsaturated soils, we have to be specific to say permeability to water.